Tony Hawk is uh, amazingly involved in the games. He would call me at like three in the morning, say, hey, I was playing the game, you know, and, <laughs> and this doesn't feel right, you know? It's like, all right, you, you know, you, is it okay if we fix this tomorrow morning, you know? <laughs> Welcome to Startups with Peck, where I talk about startup founders and their journey. Uh, oftentimes, it's a very non-linear journey, and I want to feature uh, basically people who are normal people who, you know, it's not so ridiculous like Elon Musk. And uh, I want to showcase uh, awesome people who have accomplished a lot, have interesting stories to share. Uh, that might not be featured and because it's not sexy for the media to portray this because it's a, not an overnight success. But I think most uh, people's journeys, uh, success is hardly ever overnight and, and hardly ever linear and hardly ever singular where, oh, I started Uber and it's just billion dollar company. Um, and, and also I want to feature, uh, you know, more, more diversity and, um, yeah, that's, that's what I want to do with the show. So on this episode today, we have Josh Sui, who I've known for a long time. Uh, and I finally get to feature his interesting story, but our paths have crossed uh, because of uh, some history with uh, mutual history of Mortal Kombat and Midway Games, which we'll talk about. And uh, Josh has founded two uh, awesome studio, game studios, Studio Higante and Robomoto. And uh, his latest journey is, uh, as a executive producer of a documentary, which uh, features uh, a history of gaming and arcade games, and his latest involvement in uh, experiential agencies, which you'll talk about. So welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Hey, Peck. Thanks for having me. I'm really, uh, really, uh, really honored you asked me. <laughs> well, you have a very interesting story, and uh, you're you're part of uh, video game lore, uh, at least in America, and uh, we want to feature that. Uh, for those of you uh, who don't know, uh, or maybe you know, during arcade games times, uh, Josh, would you love to tell us about uh, your kind of start before you started your own companies, uh, where you worked, and and how that came about? Yeah, one of my first jobs uh, coming out of college um, was working at this uh, video game company called Midway Games, uh, and this was in the early '90s. And uh, and I, you know, I got in as a what they back then called a video artist, which is completely meaningless. It's just you're just going to come in and anything that's visual, you're going to work on it. And so I came in, and I came in with um, you know coming out of film school, so I didn't think I was going to be doing video games all my life. I just thought it would be something fun to do, and I love video games. I was a 80s arcade kid you know like crazy with video games so i got in and uh, and it just happened to be at the time when games such as mortal kombat and nba jam were blowing up all over the arcade so i came in at a really crazy time and i got to kind of witness uh history in the making as i'm working with this team and it was it was an amazing uh, amazing start it was even though the company was making billion dollar franchises um it was still like a small group of um for lack of a better term, idiots hanging out, <laughs> <laughs> hanging out and and just making games for our, for our own entertainment. You know, we're just trying to make ourselves laugh and uh, and you know. So that was how I got started in video games was at Midway, and I was there throughout um, from '93 to '99, and then I went off to uh, to start my own company with one of the uh, co-creators of Mortal Kombat. So you were weren't you also they used your likeness at times too right so you weren't you weren't only the artist in there sometimes they they leveraged you for your your looks <laughs> yeah yeah that that was, that was one of the side benefits of the lack of diversity in the workplace was that uh, <laughs> because i was the i was the only i think i was pretty much the only asian person in the entire studio so it got to a point where when they actually needed a real asian face um i was like convenient and so <laughs> you were there. <laughs> yeah, I was there. No, seriously, you know. And so I would like to think it was me because of my sparkling good looks back in the day, but I think it was just like more because out of convenience. And um, but it's funny because it was within 
the first like I think two weeks I was there, that's when John Tobias, the one of the co-creators of Mortal Kombat, uh, he like he asked, hey, can I you know can I take a picture of you and put you, you know, I need you you know in the game? I'm like yeah, absolutely. This is for Mortal Kombat too. And so they took the picture, and a couple of days later, I see myself as the face of Sub Zero uh, for the ending of the game, and I thought that was awesome. I was like I was like so excited, you know, but I didn't realize that 20 plus years later it would keep popping up it'd be it's become a gag now whenever somebody <laughs> meets me somebody else will pop up that picture and put me in there so, so i'm in a yeah. bunch of games at, at midway anytime there's an asian 80 percent chance it's me you know? token token asian guy exactly taken, exactly yeah, but real. it just shows you how different it was back in the 90s and you know uh in chicago game industry that it was just you know it was not diverse at all so like me being there was kind of a novelty so I have a similar story because, uh, you know, our, our mutual connection is I, I too was in the Mortal Kombat games, but uh, starting uh, Mortal Kombat 5 when when you guys started using motion capture. Uh, and with motion capture, literally, they, they don't even need my likeness. They're not using my likeness. But for whatever reason, I ended up playing all the Asian guys. Like, it's not like I was like, well, did I move Asian or something? <laughs> It was like Liu Kang, Kung Lao, you know, and all these other Asian characters. Like, it's, it literally could be anybody. So, That's like, so why funny. am I all the Asian guys? That cracks me up. Yeah, there might be, there's an error. There's that Asian error that comes through the mocap suit, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not replaceable there. Yeah. So, when did you decide to start your own game studio? How did you go from, you know, decide, you know, working a, in the art department to to starting your own game studio? Yeah, it was, I mean, it was a lot of different things, but really I think it came down to was, what it came down to was I saw that there was a ceiling in terms of my growth at the studio. And, you know, I, I come from a long line of entrepreneurs in my, my ironically restaurant entrepreneurs, so it's had nothing to do with media, but, um, but like me and my, my grandparents own their own business. They had their own restaurant. My dad had his own business, but both my parents had their own businesses. Uh, when we lived in Los Angeles, and then we moved to Michigan, uh, and my and my family opened up their own restaurant there, and my brothers have their restaurant. So everybody had their, had their own businesses, and so that was it. wasn't like oh, I have to have my own business to keep up with the family. It was really it was just kind of ingrained into me that eventually I should have you know I should at least have one business somewhere in my life. <laughs> and so so when I saw you know after six years at Midway. Um, I really loved working there, loved the people. So I never had any problems or, you know, any, you know, any grievances with the company. It just, I felt like, Hey, I think I've done everything I can at this point. And I was still, you know, pretty young at the time. And so part of this, a little bit of naivety, you know, I thought to myself, you know, the arc, you know, the, the video game world is shifting a little bit around 99. That's when arcades were starting to die and home systems were becoming more and more powerful, even more powerful than the arcade machines. And so me and people like John Tobias and Dave Mikitich and everybody, we kind of saw this shift happening and it kind of dovetailed with my desire to leave because I, I just felt like I was hitting the ceiling. And so that kind of all came together and we saw an opportunity. And so it was literally, we didn't have really any plans outside of, hey, you know what, we have a good track record. Let's go off and do our own thing and let's see how this plays out. And you know, when I look back on it now, it's it's very naive to think oh we can go off and make our own game studio even though we've never you know run the business <laughs> before we've never you know done a game completely by ourselves we just had that uh we had the guts to do it and so we just did it and it just it just ended up working out obviously there were a lot, it was a lot of work getting it up and running and such but um it, it, it I don't think we ever had the feeling of hey there's no way this is going to happen it was just it just felt like it was inevitable that it was going to work out and what was the first title? Uh, the first title was uh, was a Microsoft exclusive for the first Xbox called Tao Fang. And uh, it was a fighting game. Uh, and we, ironically, when we left Midway, we thought to ourselves, we don't want to make a fighting game because we don't want to get pigeonholed into it. But then Microsoft shows up with a bucket full of money and they're like, you guys want to make a fighting game? We're like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> You're pigeonholed in that. You're like, oh, yeah, these right. guys know how to know, make a fighting game. It's low yeah, risk. Exactly. Yeah. And it was, you know, it, it, that's, that was an example of just good timing. Um, and and it, it wasn't luck. It was looking for what was going on and making the jump, knowing that, hey, this, it seems like everything's kind of converging. And so at the time, 
Microsoft was doing the first Xbox and they were looking for teams to kind of fit, fit in certain slots. Oh, we need a fighting game team. We need, you know, a, a first person shooter team and things like that. And so that's where we kind of fell in that we just happened to leave Midway at that time. And so they came and, you know, they asked us for a pitch for a fighting game and we put together a pitch and a uh, prototype animation to show them what it can look like. You know, John Tobias being the co-creator of Mortal Kombat obviously had a lot of sway in their, you know, in their decision. And, uh, and that worked out really well. They basically funded the startup of the company um, by funding that game. Yeah, that's awesome because then you didn't have to raise money and, and go, yeah. Um, yeah, I remember that, that was on the Xbox, right? Like the, the reason yeah. they needed a fighting game that was exclusive to Xbox. That was also around the same time that Midway was launching uh, Mortal Kombat 5. And that's when I started doing motion capture for the, the video yeah. games. We just, um, we just missed pass. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. We we just crossed myth, yeah, crisscross, and I, you know, I knew about Tao Feng, and I really wanted. Yeah, you know, I didn't have an X. You know, I was more on the PlayStation camp, so <laughs> I, I got the Xbox way later. Sure. I waited a little bit, but uh, I, I also, I wish I had been. You know, I wish I had known you then to to also have been involved in that game because I was getting into you know i obviously very much enjoyed my time doing motion capture for for sure. mortal kombat 5 so that was a yeah we just crisscrossed that yeah what other titles did you end up making so after tao fang uh we were set to work on the sequel to the game so it was, it was a pretty it was a pretty moderate success it was, it was successful enough that microsoft wanted to do a follow-up um but when they wanted to follow up they uh they they were really stingy on the budget for lack of thing. <laughs> and so um, T a company called THQ uh, showed up and they had the, uh, the WWE license and they basically came up to us and said, we, you know, we like what you guys did on Tao Fang. You know, want you guys do a wrestling game. And, uh, and so, you know, there was this promise of um, this wrestling game being, you know, the WWE game being a, uh, a yearly game. It was a franchise. And so that was very enticing. And so, you know, so we ended up skipping on the Tao Fang sequel, much to uh, Microsoft's chagrin, and we ended up working with THQ on, uh, on WrestleMania. And, you know, I'll tell you, it was, it, that's an example of something that was a good business decision, but a terrible culture fit. And so, you know, so as business owners, we thought, you know, this is fantastic because now we have a franchise when have year, you know, re yearly recurring recurring you know, revenue. revenue. Yeah. Stability, exactly. so, right? Yeah. 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 So it sounded great. You know, the thing that we underestimated is that, you know, that there's business, but then there's also creativity. Not that they can't, not that they can mix together, but our team, you know, we're all a bunch of creatives and we have a business run by creatives. And basically what happened was that because none of us were really that into wrestling at that point, um, the game suffered a lot and we made a lot of mistakes because it, our heart wasn't into it. The entire team. You were passionate about it. Yeah. Yeah. We were passionate about doing Tao Fang too. Like everybody, we knew exactly what we we're going to do and we're, what we we're going to fix from the previous games and everything. And now with this game, it was like starting from scratch again. So obviously we still tried to work as hard as possible and make it as fun as possible and, yeah, and, and put in the work, but you know, the heart just wasn't there. And and this took me a long time to look back on in hindsight, you know, on what went wrong in that game, but it, that it literally was that it's just, you know, the passion wasn't there and it, and ultimately you know, it came out, it did, it did actually do pretty well. Um, it had, you know, all kinds of problems with it and everything, but, um, but it didn't do well enough that THQ wanted to continue their relationship with us. And, and ultimately that you know, closed up our shop um, because it was a tough time in the business because, it was a console shift where it was going from Xbox to Xbox 360, PS, PS2 to PS3. And that's a very harrowing time for developers because at that point, um, third party developers um, have a tough time uh, making that transition. So it all kind of came together at that point. And that's what and we ended up closing up Gigante, um, I want to say 2004. So we were, yeah, so yeah, it was 2004 when we closed up shop. Yeah, it's uh, it's so hard to, you know, the the business decision is sound, right? So recurring revenue, uh, stability, uh, scale, uh, and then, yeah, it's it's almost a choice of like, do you do you want to do something cool that then you might have to go hunt, 
and and find the next project over and over again or or like yeah like with the, the those franchises whether it's nfl or nba or you know call of duty or whatever where every year you're pretty much guaranteed that you're going to refresh that and yeah that's that's a tough one yeah it was yeah so it it was definitely a big learning lesson that that i carried over you know later on yeah yeah and then did you uh, end up starting something else right away no, so what ended up happening, uh, so the silver lining in all this is that the um, when we closed up Gigante, uh, we had you know we had a full team you know you know uh, in house, and what was going on at the exact same time, EA had bought a studio out in the suburb of Chicago, and they turned it into EA Chicago, and they were getting they were having some moderate success with the Fight Night franchise for EA. And so they were on the third iteration of the game where they were going to make it for the Xbox 360 and they were just going to make the, the best boxing game ever. Uh, and so, but the problem is, is that they, they, they had promised that they were going to make this incredible game. They had this beautiful demo that they showed, um, at, I think at E3 and things like that. And uh, it, was, it was all more or less bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> It was just a demo. And so now they had to basically now make the game look as good as that demo. And they're horribly undermanned. And at that exact moment, that's when Higante was closing. So what ended up happening was that the entire studio literally got transplanted over to EA. And so our entire team, except for me and the other owners of the company, all went to EA. The rest of us, we were too busy just cleaning up you know, the closing of the studio. Um, but what ended up happening was that we got contacted by the head of EA Chicago, and uh, and he basically said like, hey, you know, we, you know, we hired your entire team, and every single one of them said that we should contact you because contact you guys because they like they thought the world of you and felt felt like you guys should be coming in and managing that team in at EA. So we're like. That sounds fantastic. <laughs> so like, yeah. Why not? You know. So we ended up all going to EA Chicago, and we busted our asses on this game called Fight Night Round Three, uh, which like is right behind me here, and it ended up being one of the best games I've ever worked on. Besides, and one of the best experiences I've ever had, um, just working on a game. But it's like you know, but the game itself. Um, obviously, I'm biased, but I think the game itself is is a masterpiece. And even to this day, when I look at it, I'm shocked by um what we did on it and, and i was really proud of it because i was the art director on it. i was one of the art directors on it and the visuals that we did it was just it was like a dream come true being able to work on new hardware and concentrate on just sheer graphical power um was really enlightening and and it really yeah it it really changed my changed my mind on what you can do in video games yeah yeah and was it also easier or less pressure in the sense that now you're not owning and running the studio and you just could focus and you know it's weird was that um i couldn't shake the muscle memory off of myself of being an owner of a company so it took me a while to really shake that off so i would go when i first started at ea i was really stressed out because every little thing that would happen every little speed bump or whatever i really like i took it on myself and and it took me a while to realize wait i'm not the owner of this company i don't have to worry <laughs> about this i need to worry about my team obviously but i don't need to worry about like oh man if we do this is it too expensive you know or like you know do we really need to cater meals three times a day like all these little stupid things that, you, that as an owner you have to think about um it took me probably a good year to really shake that off of myself yeah. so 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 that yeah, so that was good. So once I shook it off, it was just like, oh, I can just concentrate on on the job that yeah, yeah. I'm supposed to have. Um, but yeah, that, it it took a while. <laughs> and how and and what? Uh, how did you or how did that morph into your next adventure to open Robomoto? Yeah. So what happened was that you know the the the, the financial crisis of two thousand eight happened, and EA closed up a bunch of uh, studios, and um, at that around that same time, Activision had contacted me about uh, starting up a new studio in Chicago and that they wanted to take over um, one of their franchises or, or a part of one of their franchises. And so um, so I jumped at that because here's an opportunity to um, kind of repeat kind of what we did with Microsoft, which is start up a new studio, 
uh, get funding for it and literally not give out any equity, which is crazy. So this is like twice now that this has happened. Right, funded funded by somebody who's going to finance it for their next game. That's amazing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So they came in and uh, and you know again this is a you know I, and I think this is maybe something that entrepreneur entrepreneurs have is just sometimes you just have the sense of you have this bit of naivety on that you can do something and you just kind of take the plunge. And so the idea was, you know, we want you to bring your team from EA Chicago, form a new studio. Um, we're going to give you uh, one of three franchises. It's either going to be Guitar Hero, Call of Duty, or Tony Hawk. You know, we'll give you, you know, but wow. we, don't know what it, we don't know what it is. They all sound you, awesome. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, hell yeah. You know, like, I'll, I'll, take, I'll, I'll, I'll take any of it. In my heart, I wanted Tony Hawk because I, I come from California. I skateboard and everything. So... You know, I had a Tony Hawk board. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. And so, um, and so, you know, so they wanted us to do that. And then, so when we got the Hawk franchise, the other thing that they said was, oh, and by the way, uh, we want you to make a game that uh, requires people to stand on a skateboard and you need to design the hardware for it because you come from an arcade background. So you should know this. So it's take over a franchise, form a new studio, um, and then and create a new controller for, for a skateboarding game all at the same time. And we had less than two years to do it. And, uh, and it was just crazy. But yeah, so, you know, so everything uh, before then, you know, working at Midway, starting at Gigante, working at EA, that all culminated in form into, you know, forming Robomoto. Yeah. And then, so did you end up working pretty closely? How involved was Tony Hawk? Yeah, Tony Hawk is uh, amazingly involved in the games. It's not like John Madden, where like he slaps a name on and cashes a check. I mean, it's Tony was Tony is very involved in skate culture, obviously, and anything that has his name on it, he wants to get involved in. But particularly the video games, because if you really think about it, before the games, Tony was a well-known person, but he wasn't like quote unquote Tony Hawk. You know, it was really the games that made that made his you know made him who he is now. And so he you know he was really um, involved a lot and you know he actually was the one that first thought of the idea of hey you know what you know people love playing guitar hero why not make a game where people stand on a skateboard i mean that was basically his idea and activision it was like all right let's do it you know so he started that whole thing and so because you know people are standing on the board you know he he knows what what that should feel like so he was constantly playing the game I mean, he was getting to the point where he would call me at like three in the morning say hey i was playing the game you know, and, and this doesn't feel right. You know, it's like, all right, you, you know, you, is it okay if we fix this tomorrow morning? You know? That's awesome. Uh, it, from what it sounds like, you ended up having a pretty close relationship with Tony. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's crazy when I think about it that we worked together for almost 10 years and I didn't even realize it. You know, so ultimately we ended up making uh, four Tony Hawk games. And, you know, I thought we were going to get fired after the first game based on, <laughs> based off of my experience with THQ and stuff, but it's, uh, yeah, we did four Tony Hawk games and, uh, and to this day, you know, I still very friendly with them. Um, you know, the documentary that I made, uh, he was gracious enough to make a cameo in the documentary. I'm just a real stand up person. And, um, he's just one of those people that, you know, like skateboarders in general are like the underdogs, you know, of, of action sports culture or, yeah, or even pop culture. And so I, I think he always had that in him is of that, no matter how big and famous I am, yeah, I still want to keep myself real. The skate culture is all about authenticity. And so he doesn't go around being, being a jerk about things. Um, so, and that's what, something I really appreciate about him. Yeah, he's. It sounds like he's really humble and down to earth, and uh, I understand that he, you know, even your your kids have a relationship with him. Yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah, it's it's kind of crazy. Like, yeah, we went to, you know, like you know, we 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 actually flew to San Diego to go to one of his kids' birthday parties, you know, when they were younger, and uh, it was crazy. Like, we go to a birthday party, and out on the front yard is uh, Yo Gaba Gaba performing, like the actual actors and everything. I was like, what the hell? <laughs> That's <laughs> crazy. So crazy. yeah. It's a whole other world. So, so whatever happened uh, to the studio then after that, after so the we, four games? Yeah, so, so Robomoto was around for about 10, almost 10 years. Uh, we did four Tony Hawk games. 
um, over those years. And then we did a bunch of other games in between and mobile and things like that. How big was the studio? You know, the studio, yeah. boy, at, I mean, at its peak on our second hot game, I think we're at a, like well over 60 people. Um, wow. And that's all working on one game. Um, and then it just, it would fluctuate on, based off that. So, you know, by the time we did the last hot game, where I think we're, we were doing a lot more outsourcing at that point. So in terms of full-time staff, it was probably around like 25 people is my guess. And, uh, and so what ended up happening is that it got to a point where around 2016, um, you, know, the, you know, we had come out with the most recent Tony Hawk game and, uh, and it didn't do well. I mean, I'll be honest with you, the reviews were like scathing about it. And I don't blame them for being scathing, but it was just like, I'll get into the details on that later, but basically, um, at that point, the you know, Activision, um, they shut down their one of their offices. And that was the office that we were mainly working with. And they were kind of getting, they were kind of shutting down a lot of their franchises. And the Tony Hawk games at that point was one of the franchises that they were just like, all right, we're, we're not going to do these anymore. We're just going to do only Call of Duty and, you know, maybe two other giant games. And those games are like, in, you know, involve hundreds of people. Yeah. And so at that point, you know, we had, we were doing some mobile games and we really had to come to a decision on, Hey, you know, you know, uh, where do I want to go from here? And at that point, my interest in games was probably at its all-time low. I just, I was, really, <laughs> I was really burned out on it, and I was, and I was, and I was wanting to make this film. And so I ended up um, basically f- like working out a deal with a company called Reliance um, that's based out in India, and they're a huge, uh, they're a huge comp- company, huge company out there, and they have a, a games division. And so basically. Uh, long story short, our, our, our entire team ended up getting merged uh, over to Reliance. And during that uh, process, uh, I decided I, wa- I didn't want to work in games. And so I kind of stepped out, yeah. from, out from that deal and, uh, and like changed my entire life, basically. <laughs> I, I, I left games, uh, sold, you know, we sold our condo in the city, moved out the suburbs, like everything. I just wanted like a completely clean slate. And uh, and then concentrate on working on the film, um, but yeah, it was uh, it, it was interesting. It was it was a very tough decision because I'd worked with some of the, you know some of the some of the people you know some of the co-owners that we we've worked for you know over 15 years at that point, so almost 20 years actually. So uh, it was it was kind of heart wrenching, but it was it was really just time for a break. Yeah. So was it more of like a handoff, handing off the team, or sale of the company, or how what was that like? Uh, it, I mean, it was more handing off the team. It, 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 it's a little bit, more, a little bit more convoluted than that, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it, that's the best way of describing it. It's like, we want to make it as seamless as possible. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you, you know, from a, just a treating your people, you were always able to kind of land, you know, from, from one adventure to another, you were always able to land your people somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, that was, you know, it, you know, as, as anybody who's a, who's a business owner, I mean, you don't always make, you know, you, you don't, some decisions are harder than others and stuff. But one of the things is like, as we're transitioning, you know, between Gigante and, and Robo, um, you know, especially Robo towards the end was just, you know, you know, you get close to people and you, you know, you want, yeah, you want to think at, like a business person and really make the tough decisions and such. But you know, if there's a chance that you can make the landing softer for people, you know, why wouldn't you do that? You know, yeah. so, like, you know, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, you know, we, we had one time in Robomoto, we had um, a large layoff in between, in between games. And that was, you know, that was a really tough um, scarring uh, day for myself um, because, you know, I was, I was president of the company. I had three other partners, but I really felt uh, the brunt of it. And so, you know, and, and the way we did it, it's, you know, it's like, you know, I mean, we all did, it, we did it in quote unquote, the, the, the right way on paper, you know, but looking back on it, it was just like, ah, you know what, I just, you know, it, it, yeah, you know, maybe the, the, the lawyers and stuff said that this is the right way, but it just didn't feel right, you know, and so looking back on it, you know, moving forward from there, I just thought to myself, you know, I don't want to ever be put in that type of position, you know, position again. And so that was, you know, so that kind of informed how we wanted to wind down uh, Robomoto. Yeah, it, that's always tough. I mean, I, I struggle with that all the time. I have never had uh, to do a mass layoff like you ever did, but uh, 
you know, even the, whenever it doesn't work out, it's, you know, I don't think people take any pleasure in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, well, which brings us to your next adventure as a producer of a documentary. Yeah. You went from, you know, running big, in my mind, big game studios, um, not as big as Midway, but but big, big, you know, uh, to now like producing the documentary about video games, kind of culminating your experience, you know, the, the threads, right? It's like working at an arcade game and then starting your own game studios, seeing seeing the trend from, from arcade shift to console. So you kind of jumped on the right bandwagon, uh, got lucky enough to not have to get investors, right? You just got the big companies to fund it, which is brilliant move. Uh, to now kind of doing like no more, no more games, but still yeah. you, you kind of like games that so you wanted to document that. So tell me about what, yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. So the, what, what, I'm, you know, it, like I said earlier, like I went to film school, but I, I spent 25 years in video games. I never got to make a film, you know? So in many ways it's kind of like a midlife crisis. And, um, but it's it, it, like, I, I wanted to make a film. Uh, I felt like I just need to get that off my bucket list. You know, that was, that was one of the main drivers for it. And I think the other thing is that coming off of games, um, yeah, I just, I needed to do something that I felt like I can do or learn as much as I can to do it myself. And so I kind of took this opportunity um, as kind of like my grad school for filmmaking. And in video games, you know, you, there's no such thing as an auteur in video games, okay? You can, like, you know, the idea, you have directors that have a specific style and things like that, but, you know, um, but in video games, it involves so many people and it's part art and it's part technology. And it's not, oh, art over technology or technology over art. It's literally 50 50. And it's very engineering based and such. And so you have to rely on a lot of people if you want to make, um, you know, something that is, for lack of a better term, like that feels major, that feels large. And so I always felt very hindered in working in video games that I didn't know everything in the process. You know, I come from more of a visual background or an art direction background. I don't know engineering, you know, I'm not a programmer. And so I felt like I had to really, you know, I had to really relinquish a lot of control on that end of things, which is fine. That's just, a, that's just the way the medium is. Um, when I got in, when I got back into filmmaking, seeing how the barrier of entry to make high quality film is so much lower now because technology is so so much more accessible i felt like hey you know what i think i can make a film and do quite a bit of the work myself not everything but i think i can really control it and i was at that phase of my life where i really want to do something creative but but have complete control over it i don't have a publisher i don't have investors i don't have anybody telling me how this should be so i i really took it as I, you know, I'm going to be very selfish about this and just, you know, what, you know, if I don't know how to do something, then maybe I'll hire somebody or I'll just learn how to do it. And so I went into the film thinking myself, I'm just going to sh start the beginnings of it and see how it rolls. And I ended up doing a Kickstarter, um, partly to help fund the film, but really it's more about to see if there was interest in the topic itself. And the topic was about my time at Midway in the 90s. It was something that I was intimately familiar with. And so I felt like the subject matter was something that I can grasp because I knew the history. So it wasn't going to be too, too much work uh, in, in terms of finding the stories. And then, and then, you know, and then let's just see what happens. So I, I put it up on Kickstarter and I was really shocked. Um, it did really well. And I got a lot of press from it. And luckily the, the press was luckily was from all my years in, in video games. You know, I, I ended up working in PR a lot. And so all the people that I worked with in PR, they all, you know, were able to find out about the uh, Kickstarter. How and much so did that, you end up raising? Uh, so I ended up ultimately, after all fees and everything were done, it was about $80,000. And it was funny because when I first started the Kickstarter, this is so in 2015. So back then, the, the conventional wisdom for Kickstarter was, oh, have your goal be really low because once you hit it, then you locked it in and now it'll just go up higher from there. And it sounded good on paper, but then I realized like, wait a second, if I set it really low and it stays there, now I'm committed to making it and I don't have enough money yeah, to money. do it. 
So like, screw that. So, <laughs> so, so I, I figured I did it just a really ad hoc budget of uh, what's the minimum I need, just the absolute bare minimum I need, but, I, but I'll still be able to make it. It, may, it might not be as good, but this will work. And that's what I set my goal. And luckily I, I exceeded that goal. Ultimately at the end, I spend a lot more of my own money, but that's, that was expected. Um, so anyway, how long so that, did it take? What's that? How long did it, the project take the film? So at the time, <laughs> at the time I thought, oh, it's going to take two years to make. Um, and then I was talking to some other documentarians. They're like, oh dude, it's like, you know, it's going to be minimum five years. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah, 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 it'd be crazy. And lo and behold, it was literally five years. You know? So, so yeah. I'm doing the math here, right? 80K divided by five here. Yeah. You're really living pretty lean here. Yeah, exactly. And I'm granted it was, you know, the, um, you know, so I worked on the film, but it was very part-time, you know, I still, I was doing other things, you know, I, I did take a year off to work on the film um, only. So I didn't take on any jobs or anything like that. And that got the film very far. And I really need to do that just to concentrate on it. And so that was when we moved out to the suburbs and everything. And I was just kind of like, all right, I'm just going to work on this film, drive everybody crazy by staying at home and such. And then, uh, and literally at the one year mark, um, I, you know, the film was pretty much in a very good state. And right at that very same point, um, that's when I was contacted by a company called Productive Edge in Chicago and another company, um, out in Dallas called Legends, and they were forming um, a new company called Edge Experiential. And it was a startup, um, and it's still a startup. And it basically, they were looking into, you know, creating experiential, um, uh, boy, like more like experiences, for lack of a better term, kind of like museum exhibits or you know, or uh, dome theaters and all these like crazy, you know, multimedia things um, at, at a bunch of different venues. So like, you know, one of the venues is the uh, World Trade Center building in New York. So they were putting things up there. Um, you know, they have things at the Dallas Cowboy Stadium and things like that. And so they contacted me because they needed somebody to head up this new division. Um, I went in thinking that, you know, I'll go talk to them, but I have no desire to have a job. I was like super lazy <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah, because I, I was just like, man, you know, you know, I'm, do, I'm doing nothing, you know, this is awesome. And, uh, and so I went in and interviewed and they showed me like all the stuff that they were looking to get into. And it's just, it was amazing. I mean, I was just looking at it, I was like, wait a second, like I'm gonna be able to design the theater and shoot the film for it or help produce the film for it. And it felt like a culmination of a lot of things that I had been doing, you know, I had just come off of finishing the film and I come from a video game background and all of that all worked within, you know, what they were looking to have me head up. So I bit the bullet, took a chance and, uh, and started doing stuff, you know, with the uh, edge experiential, um, you know, started building up the team and we've done, we've done some great installations in, uh, in Washington, DC. We're working on something at the world trade center right now. We're wrapping up something at the new SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles, and it's uh, it's 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 crazy. I didn't think that you know at this point in my career I'd be learning so many new things um, on top of you know all these other things that I brought in. So it's been yeah. a, a lot of fun. How, how has uh, that business been affected by COVID, with a lot of places being shut down? Yeah, so it was like I mean, obviously, um, like museums and clo are closed. A lot of those places are are, are shutting, you know, have shut down, and. The irony was that we were working um, in Los Angeles uh, at, at SoFi Stadium, and that project was already well in progress, so it didn't change anything there. So I've been work I've been working on that project for the last year now, and so we've all been working from home. I've had to travel to LA, which was kind of harrowing, off that man. <laughs> so, but uh, so that hasn't changed much. And then the the other project that we're doing in New York. Um, that was already a bit delayed even before quarantine. And so now it's coming back on again. So it was a pretty seamless bump, you know? I mean, coming out of um, quarantine, you know, like whenever that's going to be, it looks like a lot of venues, are, I mean, people are hungry to get out. So a lot of these venues are really starting to think about like, well, what, you know, what do we need to change um, on what we're doing already to bring people back. And so we're working, um, you know, with that also. Very nice. Uh, back to the documentary, because I definitely want to promote it on the show. Yeah. How well has it done? And uh, I see that you you got uh, it's on sale on Amazon as well, right? 
Yeah, so it's uh, yeah, it's it's doing like really well. I mean, that's uh, I'm really happy with the reception it's gotten, and uh, you know, it's it's a it's a small indie film, so the 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 word of mouth, you know, from people has been amazing. Um, yeah, it's out on Amazon, Vudu, iTunes, Google Play, Apple TV. I mean, it's on all the major um, video on demand uh, platforms, and so and so that's it's going to be on there for a while, and then it's. It's already has sold to certain territories such as Australia and Norway and some other countries. So we're kind of like we're sticking with the video on demand for right now. Yeah. Who's we, way. by the way? I thought it was oh, all we. <laughs> a royal we. Oh, yeah. I should also backtrack. Like I, I ended up not doing everything on the documentary. So there are other people that I ended up, you know, bringing on. But um, but I'm working with um, an agency called Cargo Film and Releasing, and they specialize in very high end documentaries. And they've been they've been awesome. So they've been the sales agent for the film and uh and it's uh you know I, I went with them because i saw the caliber of documentaries that they represent and i just felt man to be in that to be amongst that company um you know would would really give it you know for lack of a better term an air of legitimacy like video game doc there's a ton of video game documentaries out there and some are really great and some are not that great and that was a real concern for me was that I didn't want to make a documentary and have it feel like it was a throwaway. I didn't want people to think, oh, it's just, you know, it's about video games. These video games kind of, you know, they, they, they tend to have, um, people tend to look down on the medium and I wanted to, you know, make sure that I got the proper respect. So it was really important that I work with an agency that would give it that, uh, that legitimacy. So yeah, they've, they've been awesome. Yeah. After this experience, are, are you over documentaries or you got another one in you or what's going on? You know, it's, it's like video games. So the curse, uh, the old saying is the curse of video games is that once you make a game, you you want to make another one. It just never, that bug never leaves. So that's what I have right now with the documentary is that um, I, uh, I feel like um, I've learned so much that I need to capitalize on it. If I don't do another one, I just feel like all that knowledge that I've gained yeah. in five years, it's thrown away, you know? So yeah, there's been, there are a few topics that I'm thinking about. And I think one of the things that I'm really concerned about is I love video games, um, but do I want to do another video game documentary? Like, do I want to get pigeonholed into that? And is that necessarily a bad thing? That's been my, my battle lately and trying to figure right. out what the next uh, right. subject is going to be. So I have like, that's also your unique advantage because you've been that's, in that industry, yeah, right? Yeah, that, that's a good point. I, you know, it's, you know, if I were to put on my business hat, it, it would be, all right, if I do another video game documentary, then you start building a catalog, you start building a business, you know, and right, it becomes a brand. You, exactly. you now do. Yeah. So, so I understand that. And, and that's, you know, and I'm very, you know, business minded in that way. And so, but then on the other hand, it's like, oh, you know, I wouldn't mind doing something that's more pop culture related or more historically you know, related and such. But at the same time, if I do that, it's going to feel like I'm starting over again. Whereas I can, you know, there is a desire to build on top of, you know, what I have already. So yeah, it's an eternal yeah. struggle, you know, it's like, right. like the yeah. commerce and art, you know, that balance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are people, you know, another thing that I run into is, what has been successful for me is, you know, sometimes I have like, I've always not succeeded because I always kind of did my thing thinking like, oh, I know better. It wasn't until I started listening to people and what what they wanted, kind of give people what they wanted and that I have some sort of modicum of success. Uh, I guess what are, what, are, what are people asking you to do these days is like, oh, are there any requests? In terms of like another documentary, yeah, yeah, more games documentary. I mean, it's like I, I any particular it, one. Uh, I don't want to say in case I end up doing it, you know, <laughs> but it's very related to what I've done already, and yeah. I, and it's and, and I'll tell you, it, it's very flattering. Like you know, like I you know, and I don't. I'm not saying this to 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 my own horn, but it was just such a, a amazing compliment that it just floored me. Was a uh, Chris Gore, who runs Film Threat Magazine, Film Threat website, a major film website, um, you know, I, he interviewed me on, uh, you know, for their podcast, and you know, he loved the movie. And he just basically he just said, like, you know, you know, you know, I want you to make like all the document video game documentaries. You should just be the only person that makes video game documentaries. There you go. Like, wow, damn, man. I was like, and Chris, I'm a big fan of Chris Gore because I used to read his magazine back in the 90s when I was in film school. And so that just, it was, you know, it was amazing to me. Um, 
but again, that's like to what you're just saying is that I think you're right. It's like just, you know, there's listening to people and and hearing what they want out there is not a bad thing at all. And that doesn't mean that takes away any of my artistic creativity or ownership of something. You know, I, yeah. I think being open to that is is a very good, uh, very good thing to do. So yeah, yeah. I, there's a very good chance it will be another video game documentary, but I think I, I just... I just need to find the right angle. I think that's, I think if anything is going to stoke my creativity is I, I did it this way this time. If I do another video game one, how would I do it differently? You know? I mean, there's this, the analogy or like the, there's a sort of a parallel track, you know, like the, in, in terms of video games, like there's the old game Castlevania, right? And mm -hmm. uh, at some point Castlevania games or Metroidvania style games were no longer profitable for Konami and they stopped doing that. And, yeah. but people still wanted that and uh, people were craving that. And uh, I think the creator, he, he ended up going outside of Konami and building his bloodstained ritual of the night, which is oh, yeah. kind of like the, uh, you know, harkens back. And I ended up buying that. Well, he, he raised uh, the creator, he raised uh more than enough money to create that game on, on his, you know, on his own terms, finally. Yeah. And he created that. And I actually bought that game too. And, uh, well, that's and amazing. Really, yeah. yeah. That's amazing. We live in a time where somebody can do that, you know, just like, yeah, you know what, I'm going to go back to, you know, what I did before. And because people are asking for it and fans are craving it. Like I yeah. haven't had a, you know, the, the, you know, symphony of the night Castlevania was one of the best, you know, Metroidvania style games ever. And yeah. like, there wasn't anything like that anymore. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Oh, speaking of video games. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. We're going to, uh, this has been an amazing story and, you know, and, and our intersection in terms of video games and, and skateboarding and, and uh, just the tech scene in Chicago. Uh, I love this story because it's so, one, it's so nonlinear. And, and two, uh, I, I love how you, learning about how you were able to fund your, your company uh, using, you know, I, I think people, everybody's kind of knee jerk reaction to having an idea is to go out and raise money. And you yeah. were able to fund both game studios creatively or, or leveraging, you know, the demand. Uh, and then also kind of a, a pivot in your career uh, to, to filmmaking. Um, I think it's an interesting story. And, uh, you know, I've, I've kind of, learn bits and pieces through our relationship. And I, I guess I haven't really learned the whole story until to today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. I, you know, just, uh, just speak to that, you know, just speak to just the uh, starting up thing with an idea. It's, you know, I think the one thing that I didn't bring up is just having the right people around you, like who you, who you're around, you know, there, and not just for business purposes, but just in general, it's like, if you're around a bunch of people that are just, jerks and uh and, and uh, just don't have the right mindset you know you're never gonna get anywhere and so i i think that motivated me you know in both instances both higante and robomoto i just happened to be around people that were excited as excited about the opportunity as i was and were willing to make that leap of faith yeah and i, I don't know i i didn't think you know outside of midway games i, I wasn't very familiar with game studios uh, i just figured game studios were somewhere else and not chicago yeah. Uh, so I, I was very surprised that at some point I learned that you you were creating the Tony Hawk games here in Chicago. You know, it's like, oh, I thought, you know, Midway Games was a big, big player in town. And that was like the only visible thing. So it's cool to see and hear and know that, you know, there are things happening, you know, kind of outside the the major meccas of the, that you would expect. So it's really cool to see that there was like a lot of cool stuff going on in the game industry in Chicago. Yeah, no, most definitely. And you're, you're part of that history. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's crazy history. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and now it sounds like you're starting potentially building a uh, video game documentary franchise. So I, I highly support <laughs> it. Yeah. Start, um, have you looked, I don't know, have you looked in, have you heard of WeFunder? No, I have not. It's a way to fund, it's kind of like similar to Kick kickstarter but uh we funder the people who fund you can own equity you can raise from investors uh actually there's a sort of a, a wuxia kind of film studio starting that i, I recently funded really? there but 
you know, that that's potentially look into that. I'm going to look that up. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Thanks, but no, thanks, Peg. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's great talking to you. It's 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 gonna be nice to see you more often than uh, than now my that I'm one back. off. Yeah, no, then as opposed to my one-off trips to San Francisco, where we see each other for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs>